So this information is regarding the history in and around Barntown during the 1916 Rising. So one of my neighbours, on telling him that my grandfather was in the 1916 Rising in Dublin, he then um, said that his grandfather was in the 1916 Rising in Wexford in Barntown. So what I did was went off and did some research because I had researched my grandfather's um, history from the archives, the military archives. So I went off to find about uh, Tom Stafford, Tom Shoto Stafford, they call him. So um, basically we, where we start off, this is a testimony by the captain of the brigade in Wexford. And he starts off, um, There's a, they go into town to see what's happening. They hear something's happening. They go into town and they see an old woman who sold apples and oranges from a basket. And she's running down the platform of Wexford station yelling, Oh, let me get home. The murder maskers, let me get home. And then he says he ran to the guard's van and he asked, what's up, John? And John Doyle was the guard. And John said jovially, "Why well, the shinners are up. They've taken the railway station and the post office and everything. They've even taken Dublin Castle. We had to get a permit from Countess Markovich to get this train out. So then John then goes to find his commanding officer. Um, who is O'Connell um, and he lives in Wexford and he's saying um, that he wants them to go out and you know do some um, rising themselves basically and uh, so finally O'Connell said whatever the position was he was not going out to continence any movement until he got a definite order from Dublin and that he was going to bed and he did the rest of us, after consultation, decided to start as soon as we could to get the fellows mobilised before leaving for Enniscorty. Seamus Doyle decided to have another try with O'Connell, and after a while he came downstairs to say the latter was getting up and that he was coming out with us. He was going to Enniscorty with Seamus. Before they left, we sent a man to Rosslare Harbour to wreck the ra railway line at the viaduct so as to hamper movements or any reinforcements for the British who might be coming from England by that route. Now, what they did there was really, really important in the 1916 effort in that they stopped any reinforcements coming by boat from England by wrecking the railway line. And that was really important for the people who were holding out in Dublin. So at six in the morning, Seamus Sinnott and I started out for the rendezvous, John Furlong's house at Skater Park on the side of the Tree Rocks Mountain. It began to rain as we pushed our bicycles up the steep hill past the reservoir. It was persistent drizzle and we soon got wet to the skin. It was a depressing start. We were cheered, however, when we came to Tom Fielding's house. Tom was the lieutenant of the local company. His uncle, Phil Doyle, was in the yard, sprung a manure into a cart. He was a retired contractor and a builder who had always been a strong supporter of John Redmond. God bless the work, we called out. Fee leaned on his sprung and stared at us. You too, he said, what's up? Dublin is up, said Sean, and I added, Dublin Castle is in the hands of the Irish. The Lord be praised, said Phil, taking off his hat. He turned to the house and called, Tom, Tom, come out, get your gun and come out. Tom came running out and we had to tell him again. He shouted in the light and Sean told him we were on our way to John Furlong's house. Um, so they were mounting their bicycles and Phil Doyle called out Taranons, you're not going like that come in and have something we haven't time said Sean well the blessings of God be on you called Phil who had forgotten all about the parliamentary party when the little mountain road brought us to the main road the Duncannon line neither of us knew whether John Furlong's house lay to the right or the left we saw a young lad of about 12 outside the labourer's cottage and asked him where John Furlan live. he lived. He said he did not know. This was unbelievable for we knew the house must be only three or four hundred yards away. Do you know anybody by the name of Furlan around here? asked Sean. Not at all. There are Furlans across the other side of the mountain in Barntown. We mounted our bicycles and rode off, but we'd not gone 20 yards when the boy hailed us. We dismounted and he ran up to us. You wouldn't be Captain Sinnott, he said to Sean. Yes, that's who I am. Ah, now I know, said the lad with a wide grin. Why didn't you tell me who you were? You might be anybody, the police or anybody. Sure, I know where John lives. 
Why wouldn't I? It's the second house you come to on the left. We tanked the boy and rode on and we entered Furlong's Haggard and we saw John and his mother in the kitchen. John came to the door and his mother peered over the shoulder. Hello, boys, said John. Sean jerked his head, beckoning him. I want to order to John, he says. Come on in, said John, sure. You can shout loud anything you want in here. He grinned broadly and asked, are we going out? We are, replied Sean. I thought so by the look he is, said John cheerfully. His mother felt our clothes. Glory be to God, she said, the creatures are drowned. Take off your wet clothes and dry them by the fire there. There was a blast and fire of first branches. The old woman went out. So are you going out? Thanks be to God, I live to see this day. This old woman had three sons. All of them were going out to risk their lives. Our liberty in what had for ages been a furlong cause. And her own words were, thanks be to God, I live to see this day. In my own experience in 1916, I encountered hundreds of women whose men, husbands or sons, brothers and lovers were involved. And with one or two exception, no woman tried to hold their man back. This is a different picture from that of the querulous, weeping women one sees depicted in the story stage and screen version of the various risings. I suppose there is more dramatic value in the picture of the man going out despite the waves of his adorning wife or sweetheart. Miss Furlong gave us dry socks and we dried ourselves piecemeal at the roaring fire and ate a hearty breakfast. After a while the lads began to drop in and one of the first was the boy we had encountered on the road. He proudly carried a huge fowling piece on his shoulder. John Furlong, who had heard a story about him, began to rag him. So you need he sent the captain astray, Tom. Indeed, and I didn't, said the boy, sitting down at the fire and holding the gun between his knees. I was only gauging them. How did I know that they might be peelers coming for you? And what are you going to do with that big gun? Ah, Johnny protested. You know well enough. Didn't you promise me that when we were going out, you'd give me a carbon for the folding piece? You know well enough you did. But you told me you were going out. The boy's face fell. Sorry, it's but who told you you were going out? And the boy's face fell. Didn't say we're not going out. And if we were itself, you're too young to come along with us. I'm not. I'm 13. I broke in. What does your mother say? She said, I'm big enough to go out with you. She said, sure, if I can't do anything else, then I can boil the spuds for the fighting men. It's darn few boiled spuds we'll get, said John with a grin. Pat Furlan, John's brother, who had cycled out from town, told us to leave the boy alone and the boy, Tom Stafford, showed his gratitude by standing up and gravely saluting. Perhaps I had better tell the story of Tom Stafford's capture here. After the rising when we had surrendered, the police carried out a very thorough drive in the neighbourhood of the Three Rocks Mountains. They were searching for the arms which they believed had been hidden there. During the raid, Tom Stafford was taken outside his mother's house by two policemen and told he would be have to divulge the whereabouts of the arms. Tom said he knew nothing about them. The sergeant said that he, be, he did not tell him he would be shot. All right, said Tom, shoot away. Very good, said the sergeant. You're leaving me nothing else to do. He ordered the constable to level his rifle at Tom. Now, he said, if you don't tell me before I count to ten, it'll be too late. Tom looked towards the window where he could see his mother. She was kept inside the house by another policeman. He heard her voice faintly. Tell them nothing, Tom. The sergeant began to count very slowly. He halted at nine and said, Tom, well, now it's your last chance. Tom said, why don't you shoot? The sergeant motioned to the constable to lower his rifle. It's no use, he said. When the police had gone, Tom's mother took him in her arms. She was crying. Were you afraid they would kill me, mother? I was, she re replied but I was more afraid you might tell. Much chance of that, said Tom. So that's Tom Stafford of Fort Mountain, and that's some of the testimony of um, his ex-capage during the 1916 Rising. So, and you, there's lots of familiar names in there as well. So I just thought it was really interesting for anybody who likes history, and um, they might actually like listening to that. Thank you.